Yes. So uh, my name is Lucien. I work for a company called SagePay. Uh, I worked in Upsay for a while. Um, I've done OWASP presentations for a while. First time in London. Um, and this time I'm going to be presenting secure continuous delivery. Uh, whatever that means for anyone in this room. Um, uh, first of all, how many how many security people are there in the room? People that actually do security full time. Okay, a lot. Um, how many of you have achieved continuous delivery? Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, and that includes security, correct? Okay, <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right. Uh, well, we're going to show you our version of that, and I have Chris here to help me. So I'm Chris Rutter. I've been a developer at CHP for four and a half years. And for the last three years, I've been heading up the security champions team, kind of the virtual team that a lot of you guys will probably have as well. I'm a developer in a scrum team, and it's been my work to try and bring security into a kind of agile uh, pipeline, an agile release process. So I've seen release cycles go from nine months to one week, in uh, quite a short period talking about maybe 18 months that happened. And I've been trying to make sure that security is still kind of uh, either the same or a higher standard in, in such short release cycles. So we're going to go through uh, the last kind of two and a half years, almost some of the problems we've had, how we've overcome them. Hopefully give you guys some ideas um, on how to tackle the same challenges you will go through when you're trying to have kind of a lot of security in such short release cycles. So the way we thought of this is that we we're different, right? So I'm, I'm all working in AppSec. This guy's a developer. So we have different problems, effectively. So um, a problem statement, uh, from, a, from, a, from an AppSec point of view, uh, I tried to kind of capture all the points that I, I thought were relevant. Um, so the first one is basically vulnerability data is everywhere. And I, I worked in AppSec teams that had various um, talents in the team, so some of them were like, oh, I want to use this tool, because this tool is great, this tool is the best tool, we have to use this one, and it wasn't expensive, so we bought it. Then we got some other guy, and he said, no, I want this tool, it's very good, it's the best, I want to use this one. So all sorts of sources, and which eventually end up on the developer's table, and effectively annoys them. Uh, at some point it annoys you as well in security because initially, whoa, like, whoa, that's, that's, that's great because I found the vulnerability, I mean, my job is effectively uh, useful, but what do I do with it? Can I, can I actually fix it quickly? Can I take all of that to my developers and, and get them to action that quickly? Um, another point was where you are with risks. Um, I mean, um, it, it's fine that you find the vulnerability, but what, what, what's the context of that vulnerability? Do you really care that it's an XSS? Maybe you do, but if it's not exposed on the internet, if you can control it in a way or another, maybe it's not that important. Um, security gates. So in my in my company, PCI DSS is very important. Um, so the, this guy, the QSA, that comes in every year, he cares about security gates. He wants to see security be bold and step in and say you can go from this from from this point on. You have to do something about these issues. So they like to see security gates. So um, there are no real agreed security gates initially in, in any development team. Um, and the last one is roadmaps. So if you go with um, with your issues to the development team, they say, I don't know. Ask the product guy if he can prioritize this for me. I'll do it. So um, there is a roadmap for product, there is a roadmap for security, which the security guys know, but how do you mix them together? How do you combine uh, those roadmaps? So that's, that's the problem statement from, a, from an AppSec point of view. And let's see the developer version. Before I tell you about how many developers do we have again? Couldn't see from there. Okay, can you hear me okay? No. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I think. Oh, okay. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, you're okay. Right. <laughs> Too loud now? No, it's all right. So I was hoping there'd be more than five devs, and it's probably about five. Okay. So from, from a dev's point of view, especially in a kind of agile cycle, so say we have a three month project with kind of one weekly releases. One of the things that, you know, as a developer, we, we find challenging with security is that a lot of the time these requirements. Um, come in very late in, in the project. So you know, we do a pen test two weeks before the project's due to go live, and lots of issues come on, valid issues, you know, that are real, really important things. 
but it's two weeks when you know we're telling our product owners this thing's going to go live in two weeks' time. And security sign-off can be a bottleneck. Uh, if there's a lot of manual processes, you have a small security team. Everything has to be signed off by kind of one person. Key dependency there. And you're on a weekly sprint. Again, you know, one or two days in a weekly sprint is a long time. One or two days in a nine-month project, not too bad. And then when am I finally secure enough? What's the kind of set standards? You know, last month, last project, this vulnerability was okay, cross site scripting. But this one it's not. What's the difference? You know, who do I ask? Is it if I ask, you know, Joe, is it this secure? If I ask Dave, is it this secure? There's no set kind of uh, education or standards between security and developers sometimes. So we kind of, I thought about this really, really hard, and I realized that I'd seen this before. So if you look at kind of five years ago, how developers and testers interacted together, how QA was seen as part of the kind of waterfall development process. You had the same issues happening. You had QA as a distinct step in the life cycle right at the end of the project. All the bugs would come up. If you assign Jira tickets, it could be a one-line code change. It was still a Jira ticket, but we fed back in the next one month development cycle. The, the time you know, between spotting the bugs and it being uh, fixed would be, would be ages. And like I said, long cycles, the key dependencies as well. We used to have kind of one tester who was the, the game of genius. Nothing can go unless he's seen it. If he goes on holiday for four weeks, you can't release for four weeks. You know, we've seen these same thing, things kind of, kind of happen. And I guess that in most of your companies, as kind of Agile comes in, you eradicate these kind of issues between devs and testers. They sit together, they test during a sprint. You know, the, the, the time between finding a bug and fixing it is probably 15 minutes these days, rather than you know, one or two months. Uh, and there's the lack of overview, so there's no idea at the moment of all the tests are automated. You kind of see the, the code coverage, you see the code quality. You get a good idea that it's, it's sound. With security, uh, again, you know, we, we find it difficult with, with less automation to see you know, how secure is this application. What are the metrics that can prove that? At least the, the kind of low-level issues that I've, I've done my due diligence, I've scanned. So the, the goals that we, we tried to set off to achieve about two or three years ago, only, so we want to identify security requirements early on in the project. We'd rather identify um, you know, high-level issues, how we're going to handle password hashing. These kind of things that take a while to affect two weeks into a project, not two weeks before the end of a project. Uh, we want to, if we do that, we think they can be viewed as true non-functional requirements. They're not seen as a blocker. It's not just pulled up at the end. It's something that adds value to the application, adds quality to the application. Uh, we want to be able to fix these kind of small issues within a sprint. We don't want to wait for a month. We just we want the devs to see that something's wrong and fix it straight away before it's released. Uh, we want security to be part of the definition of done each sprint. You know, we want, as soon as you move that ticket across the board and you say, I have a release, it should be secure, as well as tested, you know, as well as um, ready to release. We also want to define security policy. So we want somewhere everybody can see, this is the policy. There's no special cases. This is how this application is always going to be judged. Uh, and again, we want to be able to kind of measure and track all of the above when the audit comes in, uh, or when we want to prove that we're moving in the right direction that we're giving enough results to security. We are actually becoming more secure and not less secure. Basically, we want to get to this point. <laughs> because what's more secure than Chuck Norris on a motorbike with buckets on itself, and Agile as well. <laughs> so if we take a kind of history lesson, uh, we're going to be honest and kind of tell you our journey over the last couple of years. So when I you know, first started the virtual security champions team, this is where we were. This is our security sign-up process. Probably similar to a lot of people here. So we had kind of a one month dev test and release cycle. And I'm being kind to myself, so there was probably more like six months. And then what we'd do is we'd have a developer right at the end, we'd do a manual static code answer scan, and then we'd be Spotify. And then that would just be sent in an email to the security team. Black box, you know. Okay, is that secure yet? It would come back, there'd obviously be issues, you know, nobody's really looked at it yet. And there would be those issues that take the form of Jira tickets, and then they'd be kind of allocated to somebody. And we'd have to pick them up before the next release, or, or the, the story would block. So that's kind of the first iteration. Is that familiar to, to many people? Yeah. So we've all kind of you know, seen this kind of thing. So the, the kind of pros and cons for the devs, there's a lot of cons there. You know, we have bottlenecks, we have key dependencies, we have a, this cycle time I'm talking about is one month, if not six months, you know, between the issue being raised to the issue being solved. And we have unclear sign up criteria because security is such a black box. Developers aren't being educated, you know, that, that what's XSS, you know, I'll just, it's blocked my release, I don't care anything more than that. Um, 
So for the devs, mainly cons with this approach. But it, it's great for security, isn't it? Because everything goes to the security team. So they effectively get their eyes on, and on everything that happens. But this doesn't scale. So I think that's one of the, the biggest cons for, for security. Uh, I worked in another company which had 50-something scrum teams. Well, you cannot really do the work of 50-something scrum teams. There were 70 security champions. That's, that's uh, how many? Three full football teams. So, um, yeah, um, and we think this kind of brings us here. So it's comfortable, um, it's doing a job, but it's slow, and that motor behind it is probably going to blow up at some point. Um, so that brings us to um, a bit more speed. So this was the next kind of iteration, and you know, after we started identifying this as a kind of bottleneck, as honestly as the dev teams were least faster, we ran into the bottlenecks and problems. So that was the next, the next iteration of this. So we now have a, a weekly dev test and release cycle. So every week we go to production, and then we think, okay, we need still need this to be secure. Like I said, one or two days for a sign-off isn't too bad in a one month or a six month release process. One or two days waiting for sign-off in a week sprint, it doesn't work, you know, you can't have that. So what we did is we had the security champions team of creators, and we gave them the authority to sign off and set the code scans. So we had a, a kind of a verbal agreement, I guess security wrote it down, <laughs> that anything that's high or critical in four to five, and anything that's critical has to be fixed instantly. Anything that's high has to be fixed by next week. But this is all again, the sign off was an email. You know, the tools in our toolbox are emails and conversations, which is brilliant if you're a startup, but it doesn't scale, like you said. And really valuably, we ended up introduced the threat modeling. So this tackles one of the problems we had earlier. Two weeks into a project, we know what the architecture is going to be like. We start going into a session, developers who are domain experts, security who are breaking things experts. And we get in a room and we try and break it together. And you get really high value things coming out. And that's what your Jira tickets become, high value issues. Your Jira tickets don't become critical high uh, fortify scan results anymore because they're fixed within the sprint. It's just high value, big chunks of work that, that can be seen to add value. So high value for security. So we, we didn't think it could get better from the other scenario. It just did because manual static analysis now is done by the developers. So we don't need to spend time doing that. Um, and it's also adding a threat modeling exercise, which means we get to spend more time with these cool people. So uh, it's, it's, it's good for security, but it still feels like it's not fast enough. Um, so uh, you, you obviously you see someone is looking from a car, so if you, if you compare the two, probably someone is doing better. So hopefully um, we're, we're, we're arriving to that situation with this uh, next step. I just want to say the point I was trying to make there, that was a large release cycle. <laughs> Hopefully somebody did. That took me two hours. <laughs> okay, so the, the next situation, you know, the, the development team has really started using. You know, everyone's read the continuous integration book. Uh, everyone starts actually, you know, seriously um, putting it into practice. So we get a development pipeline. And how familiar? I'm, I'm assuming everyone's seen seen one of these in some capacity. Hands up if if, if yours looks something similar. Okay, so the developer will start using a delivery pipeline. Now our next iteration is to integrate automatic security scans with this. So we started our Fortify scans, our static analysis. We realized, you know, we started using um, a microservices based architecture. And we used fat jars, we used a lot of third, library, third party libraries. We did a scan of one of our jar files and it was 99.7% third party code. There's 0.3% you know, sage pick code. So Fortify is brilliant, but it's scanning 0.3% of the potential code base we're using. So we brought in the OWASP dependency checker, which is brilliant. Uh, what this does is every single time a developer um, pushes to the repository, it then gets tested in the integration environments, it gets deployed to QA, and then it gets security scanned. So you don't forget, you don't leave it to the last minute, you get almost instant feedback from your security scans. Now this is brilliant, but that takes custom logic. So the way that Fortify you know, we basically put a policy in now. So Fortify is high and critical. OWASP dependency check is anything seven and above from the CVSS scale. So to implement that, to enforce that, is custom. You know, Fortify does it differently to OWASP. We write custom Python modules. It, it's, it's a little bit difficult to maintain. Um, uh, you have to put your policy in Git, download it, pass it. It's, not, it's quite hacky, it's not free clean. So this is the kind of diagram that we have now. 
So the, the yellow parts are done by devs, by the way, the purple parts are automatic, and the blue parts are kind of security. So the pen tests and the threat model link, they still feed into the security team, as I think they always will, to be honest. That's the parts, we're never going to automate those things. We want to try and automate away the, the boring stuff, the low value. You know, they're always going to be providing high value. But we then have an automatic static scan, automatic dependency check, feed straight back into this, this one day test cycle. Probably less, to be honest, probably you know, every hour, developers checking in. Does it have any security issues? Does it have any dependency? No, it's fine. Um, pros with this one, again, we get issues highlighted quickly. We've added dependency check scans. You know, we all know that um, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in, in some commonly used frameworks. Um, but the cons is after the devs, there's a lot of effort to maintain um, the difference in report standards and enforcing these reports. There's a lot of custom code for Stripe. Right? Yeah. For, for the security team, it's getting even better. <laughs> so the developers are doing more things now, they're using more tools. Um, yeah, it's not easy for them, but uh, well, that's, that's the whole idea of doing security. Um, so, but the security team is, is effectively more uh, successful in, in providing security to, to the whole life cycle. And I guess that's the big pro with this one. It still felt like it's probably not enough. So, um, yeah, we, we thought maybe we should do something to, to uh, get rid of all that extra detail. So, that brings us to a uh, to the future, actually. Okay, so this is what we're working on at the moment, what we're trying to roll out to our other applications. It's just a video demo of us using a tool called ThreadFix, which allows us to take away some of that pain and about enforcing these policies on these kind of disparate report types. So this is an extended pipeline. So we should start the video. You might have to click on it. Just click on the this key. <laughs> I promise that wasn't staged, that was real. So this is an extended pipeline. This part looks almost the same, except we have the security policy check now. So the checking isn't done in these parts. These parts are going to upload to FedFix for the tool which is going to um, correlate and map our vulnerabilities and allow us to query it. I'm going to start it. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so these jobs now simply have load the thread fix. And this is the you've got to say the UI for thread fix. Okay, so this is the view of all of our applications and thread fix. Of our application, sorry. It's showing you the um, the the different vulnerabilities across your estate and the trends of the vulnerabilities. This is the application that I put in our pipeline. It's just a to-do application, very simple. Uh, these are the scans that have previously been uploaded by those steps you saw on the pipeline. If you notice, there is a zap scan, which you can <coughs> upload as well. So just take manual uploads as well as automatic uploads. What it does is it correlates all the vulnerabilities into um, CWEs, so you can track them all on one platform. So just to show there from Fortify, uh, you, can, you, know, you can use these filters to have a look at whichever ones you want. The policy is the interesting part. So I can attach how many policies I like, which are predefined, to the application. And ThreadFix will tell me, after any kind of scan is uploaded, whether it passes or fails. So I have three policies there, critical at any time, high that overwhelm my goals, and nothing that deals with insecure randomness. Because I've decided this application is a, card, is a tokenizer service, it needs to be random. So this is the code sitting behind the, uh, the pipeline. I'm going to add something that uses Java as random rather than secure random. You know Fortify doesn't like this because it's not secure. And then I'm going to push the pipeline. And we're going to watch what happens when it's uploaded to ThreadFix, what happens to those policies that we predefined. This was the missing link for me um, when we want red, green kind of application uh, security pipelines. Something that maps together everything and lets us easily uh, enforce a policy on it. So that's a push there. I'm going to build the pipeline. Apologies if it skips, like nobody wants to watch a pipeline go through, it's like watching paint dry. Um, but it'll still take a couple of seconds. By the way, I wish my deployment jobs would took one second. I took a lot of the liberties there and they're a bit kind of mocked. The, the scans are real, but the deployments, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> so the 45 scan for this one took about a minute and there was 
talk about uh, about the same problem. And so these are never going to go away unless there's a problem with the Jenkins job. They they are now simply just uploading the thread fix, and that's using a Jenkins plugin. I really want to do this without writing uh, any code, but like if I can get away with it. Now we should see the security policy check go red because we now have something that violates our policy. So this forms the sign off for a developer. You know, that's a release candidate for continuous uh, delivery. If that goes red, I can't release it. I have to investigate. If it goes green, okay, uh, it, it's secure. As long as we agree on a threat modeling exercise, it's fine. It's past our security policy. So we see the policy is failing now. That's the, the data that the Jenkins job we've been to. We see exactly which policy is failing. <coughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't have the use of insufficient value bodies. There we go. So what I'm going to show you now is a little bit of the, the power that the policies gives us. I only kind of doubled on a little bit of that. One of the problems that we had when we, we want to enforce these policies. What happens with legacy applications, which already had have a lot of issues? You know, it's fine saying a greenfields project, no new issues, that's easy. What about your old stuff, which everybody has, which lives in the closet? Is the, is the policy flexible enough that I can apply it to, you know, to my old stuff that I would never show, show reports to anybody? So we show you here, you can, you can choose CWEs, you can choose the severity of the issue, So for this one, if we take away the CWE, we just say critical and high. And we can also use kind of aging and day range, which is the powerful bit. I can say, you know, my legacy application, I know from six months earlier there was lots of stuff we're dealing with. Ignore that. Only take on the new issues. And if it's a critical issue, block it dead. If it's a high issue, give the dev team two weeks to fix it. Everybody understands this policy. Nobody argues when the pipeline goes red because it's in Vertex and everybody can see it. How do you control the policy? You are the developer, you write the wrong policy and it's showing green. <laughs> what do you fix? So we give you. Otherwise, you, you, you don't have the, who does control. Yeah, we'd still have the um, read only access for developers, but we'd use the security champions team. So the, there's one developer in each team at the moment, um, which is a security champion. Now they have a trust relationship with security and a kind of heightened privilege level. So they might have right access, but it's strongly audited. So you can set email alerts when anybody changes policies. So the security team have ultimate right access to ThreadFix. And security champions can read, but if anybody changes anything, an email is fired out. So again, it's turning that gate into almost like an audit. So you know, I, I'll trust certain people, but I'll make sure that I know if, they, if they're doing anything wrong. So with Redfix, uh, not that much has changed, but it comes into, into this kind of model. So one of the interesting things is that the active scans there. So we can do, with our own testers, our own developers, can do things like OWASP ZAP active scans in our applications and put them into Redfix. We can now ask for XML reports from pen testers and put them into Redfix as well. So everything that, everything that we use to detect vulnerability is in this one tool that kind of correlates and allows our pipelines to, to query them. We don't want the pen test report to go in and then fail the build straight away. So we, we say, you know, for this particular report, give the developers a, a month to fix it. You know, it's flexible enough that it's, it can kind of fit all the scenarios. Um, so the, the pros for the devs for that basically is just working. That's what you want is. That's, in the pipeline, you just want working. It can't be open for interpretation. It has to be pass or fail. This, this obviously looks good for the AppSec team. Um, the one thing uh, that it's worth mentioning here is that ThreadFix uh, is able to um, um, understand if an application is critical, uh, high, or medium risk, but that's the only thing it can do right now. Uh, so it doesn't accept other attributes. So for example, if that application deals with PCI data or if it's externally exposed to the internet. So there are things that can be improved from this scenario, which is the current scenario. So that's, that's basic. this is when we, we do look like this, uh, effectively, but we're not, never going to get to the bottom text. So we, we, uh, we need to do a bit more, 
and that brings us here. So this is what we want to do for the future. So uh, as you've seen, we have kind of static uh, scans automated, we have dependency checks automated. What we'd like to do is bring um, Zap kind of dynamic scanning into the automation as well. So the, the idea we have, sorry if you can't read that, is we want our end-to-end -end tests to all be proxy through Zap servers. So we know that when we do dynamic scans and we crawl, it takes a long time and it's kind of random fuzzing. So if we can proxy our end-to-end -end tests through Zap every single time and manage the, you know, that, the, that particular session, then we can use that as input for our Zap scans in an automated fashion. So we always have, you know, the end-to-end -end tests express how our users use the application. They are domain experts. So we basically have very directed and targeted Zap scans, which we hope kind of, um, when you do get pen testers in, it takes away the first two days of, of what they will be doing is, is that the zap scans basically or you know the, the low level kind of low hanging fruit yeah so for the for the upset team um, what is important is basically yeah you're finding the vulnerabilities people start fixing them but um, the the overall responsibility of the upset upset team is risk um, you have to do something with that risk as well you have to find a risk owner you have to find an action owner for that risk so how do you look at that application more broadly? It's not enough to say it's just critical. You need more attributes about that application and you need to apply weight, weighting to, that, to those attributes. So, um, and also ultimately you will need to integrate all of this with a GRC tool. ThreadFix that does offer these options. Uh, so basically you can integrate with, um, I don't know, tools like uh, Modulo, uh, Modulo uh, Risk Management. Um, so ultimately, Whatever doesn't get fixed needs to be uh, highlighted um, and people need to be made accountable. So uh, in, in a sort of a future version of, uh, of, our, of our goals, uh, we want to look at applying uh, contextual risk profiles to the application. So coming up with something that we call an application uh, security passport. So basically taking a number of static attributes and dynamic attributes and throwing them into a into a profile of an application, and basically you know where you are uh, at any point, uh, and you take into consideration everything that is that pertains to that application. So you can see in this example, uh, if that application deals with PCI data, if it deals with PII data, if it's um, a th third party integration, all of these attributes will assign weights again to for for this application and will. Eventually, they will increase the risk, so there is work at looking at how that risk will, will modify itself and where, where you actually set up that threshold. So it's all about that threshold, that agreement between the development team, the product team and application security. Where does that threshold uh, stand for a specific application? Um, so for the dynamic attributes, I just want to mention number of user stories. We, uh, we thought that um, that number of user stories is really relevant because the, the, the new features that you add to an application after a testing has been performed will influence uh, the, the risk posture of that application. So by, by just simply counting the number of user stories since the last test or since the last release, you will effectively gain uh, some, some insight into what happened with that application since the last test. And that is relevant in calculating the risk of, uh, of, of a future release. Um, there is also a concept of security user stories which are outputs of the threat modeling exercise, uh, which uh, we are thinking of kind of um, highlighting separately because those, those are touching security directly. So you, you really care if those security user stories get, uh, get uh, um, applied or not. Um, so yeah, so this is the kind of projected uh, architecture of how it would look in the future. So again, you have your kind of your three types of scans. You have your zap scan um, and passive mode, and then you have your active scans as well. So we can get kind of intelligent directed and um, dynamic scanning as part of the pipeline. All going to the thread fix and um, threat modeling now goes into the goes into threat fix as well. And then something we're calling Donatello, which is in its very infancy at the moment, but it's basically the engine that we want to write to extend thread fix to give it more custom kind of risk attributes. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, security is very happy with this scenario, obviously. So uh, I just want to say what the sources of inspiration were for, for all of this. Um, first of all, I, I attended some of the OWASP uh, Europe events. Uh, also, DevSecCon was attended for it by, by some of my colleagues. And 
um, also I worked with a company which deployed their own proprietary solution, uh, Bethpay. Basically, uh, everything you see, including ThreadFix, was developed by, by them internally. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for this. Um, our version, though, is more uh, uh, easy to deploy in the sense that you only need ThreadFix. ThreadFix is, has a, uh, also a free version. So there's a community version uh, and a paid version. The community version doesn't, um, unfortunately, support some of the stuff that we showed today. So like the policies feature is not supported in the community version. But still, you can, you can use a version of ThreadFix which does uh, one big thing, which is that correlation of security vulnerabilities. And the correlation, by the way, is done uh, by looking at CWE, so uh, Common um, Weaknesses uh, Enumeration. Um, and also looks at, um, I think it was uh, attack surface location, also looks at uh, code uh, flow uh, as well, into deciding which of those vulnerabilities actually um, um, are similar. So basically it reduces the total numbers. I was saying initially, you get all these sources uh, of, of information of vulnerabilities, but you don't want, when you put all of them together, this, this tool is able to make that correlation. So you can achieve that with a free version of a thread fix, um, but then again, the automation side of it will, will need a bit of tweaking if you don't buy the uh, the, uh, the full version. And I think this is uh, where we end. Um, are there any questions? Okay, guys. I have a very interesting project that the guys are doing. So question number one from me. Okay, I've noticed very interesting thing about risk, right? So you are, can you speak, pick one more slide? That one. So you're saying attribute is the number of user stories since last release. Uh, can I be a little bit picky and say, it doesn't really matter how many stories there were. Um, I think it should matter how many lines of code were modified since last release. Because you can have a story which modified a thousand lines of code, right? So I know there is a theory about how you measure risk per lines of yeah. code, per thousands of lines I, of code. I think I, I, I can simply agree with what you said and say that probably that is another attribute that we need to consider. Uh, but then again, the, the user story itself will, will detail what it does. So the fact that it is there uh, brings the application security team in a position where they could see what the detail behind that difference is between when the application was last, was last tested and the current situation where uh, you add uh, you added another three uh, user stories to it. So I, I guess if someone eventually in, in, in this context of this specific uh, uh, attribute will need to look at that detail. Uh, but again, if it's a lot of lines, uh, lines of code, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a lot of vulnerability introduced. So it again depends on what the, the user stories are about, of course. But uh, yeah, that's, that's another attribute which, which we can take into consideration. So there's one thing as well, is that a lot of, uh, we're, like I said, we use a kind of microservices-based architecture. So you know, for one particular user story, that might impact six different microservices. So the user story or the kind of group of services is that level of, you know, I've, I've changed a lot of functionality. So it could be a long time since the last bit modern exercise. In, in one microservice, that might only be three lines of code. Like across, you know, six microservices, there's a lot of functionality being changed. So it gives you more of an idea of like a functional change as opposed to just in one particular code base, you know, a couple of lines have been changed. Some of the changes, um, some of the changes may actually change the, some of the values of the static attributes. So if the change is really big, maybe it introduces uh, a feature which exposes the application to, um, uh, to, to the PCI environment or, I don't know, uh, it, it can be anything. So some of the static attributes could change because of the user stories that you add in. Uh, one maybe common, uh, maybe it was somewhere on the side, but do you do any attack surface reduction review in your threat models, or um, is it more about taking stuff out and then putting stuff in? Is that something you guys look at? I'm not familiar with that term. I mean, generally, the threat model would be kind of, you know, like uh, discuss the architecture, discuss the use cases, yeah. maybe use cornucopia as an exercise, and just to like I said, almost bring kind of features, security features, yeah. rather than just to say you can't do this. You can't do this. One of the attributes effectively is the attack surface, because we're saying um, exposure. So the exposure attribute could, 
could be the values of that attribute could be any anything that you have available. So it is I don't know internally in the DMZ, it's internally in the super trust zone, it's externally but only to some IPs, it's externally to the internet. So that that is effectively the attack surface. Also, you could add something like externally, but how many users uh, would eventually uh, be allowed to access that application? So. And all of that could be captured by these attributes, which would be set up at the beginning. So after you do your threat modeling exercise, you would start uh, uh, writing down the, the risk profile, the application security passport, how we, how we uh, named it. So that at that point, after the threat modeling exercise, you start uh, uh, noting these, type, these things down, and you start building that, that profile. Okay, the last one is using the dependency checker if you find vulnerabilities in other people's code and it's not fixed within the sprint that you're working with, mm. what do you do in those scenarios? Yeah, so uh, we have defined a kind of vulnerable dependency. So if anything that the dependency checker pulls out can be linked with a CWE. So that's where the flexibility of the policy comes in. So you could have a policy which you assign to this particular application that says that, you know, for three weeks, that's the agreement we have with the dev teams, don't fail because of this particular issue. And give it, you know, have an agreement with the product owner that we will change these dependencies in the next three weeks. So it's accepted risk for a short time. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And from my point of view, it's you know, like I, I still want red, red, green. I want this pipeline to be continuous. Um, but I understand that you know, the, the security team understand that we can't just flick a switch mid sprint and you know, and, and change lots of dependencies. So yeah, for me, that was the missing link. You know, we would start writing custom logic, but the power that that flexibility gives you in mapping, you know, that. It, uh, practicality to a, a robot that says yes or no. That was the, the real value in, in using the thread fix to me. So, so my question is, when you find issues, right, and, and take a spectrum from issues that you really want to fix to issues that are bad but you're not going to fix. So let's say a missing header, cross site scripting, SQL injection, or maybe authorization, lack of authorization between web services. Do you write tests for it? And if you do, do they pass or do they fail? This is before you even address the fix. You have a test that replicates the feature, which is basically the issue at hand. We've just started um, writing kind of security-focused end-to-end tests in our test suites. So you know we have kind of uh, some encryption issues. We write tests that exercise that. At the moment, they just live in our end-to-end -end test suite. So yeah, but they wouldn't, you wouldn't really get to the point where you're doing your security scans. It would be part of our kind of proprietary codes. That's interesting. So do you mean do you almost kind of test drive the fixes that they, that they pull up? Is that, is that what you mean? So, so what I do is I, I write a test that passes for the future, regardless if it's secure or not. Okay. And then when when you fix it, part of the fix is to break that test, and then that test is modified to become a regression test. So you have almost two suites of tests. Yeah. One that tells you what happens today in dev, QA, and deployment, yeah. and then one that contains the regression test for the stuff that we don't want to introduce in the future. What happens, I found was that if you don't do this first one, by the time you do the fix, you don't have the time or even the technology to write the test to replicate the problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant idea. And if I'm honest, um, personally, I've started to think that kind of way, and I, because I've been learning a lot more about the different kinds of vulnerabilities. I think the, the, the thing this will give us is it will highlight in a medium that developers really understand, which is the pipeline, that these issues are your issues. It's not the black box security team issues. It's something that you can, be, can deal with, can learn about, can fix. I think once we have that education, then what you're saying is by far the best way to go. I think it needs education first, though, and for developers to kind of teach them. I make them care, and then I think that's, that's the definitely. Problem is lack of QA um, APIs. It's easy to write a security test once yeah. you have a QA API. Yeah. Usually, what it highlights is the problems in QA APIs, where you can't write one end to end or at the middle tier, or even at application level, where the APIs of QA are not that good. So you think it would take far too much effort to kind of build one in house usually. Yeah, well, it's, the way I look is that is, is, is there writing security adds a lot of value because we need their QA APIs. So it's almost like we are a, a super user of their QA APIs because we have very specific requirements like here's an exploit, here's a scenario. How do I replicate this? Yeah. Right? So it's like this unhappy path. How do I replicate this? That would be fantastic. You know, like the cornucopia, the threat yeah. modeling exercise. If we could have uh, an API, you know, like a SAP does for filtering, which kind of helps it test each one of those CWEs. If you know of it, tell me, because I would I use it tomorrow. I really would. Or if anybody's writing that project, I'm happy to contribute. Okay, thanks.
So could you go back to the, that slide again, Donatel? So, um, so Donatel, I'll just like the other picture. Uh, no, 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 that one. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, there is something a little bit far fetched that I was yeah. thinking of, but I'll still make a comment on. Are you guys familiar with something called logistic regression in machine learning? So there's an algorithm that basically classifies stuff. So for example, if you have a tumor and you have a whole bunch of features to it or attributes, it just says, is this malignant or not, or if this it's a type one, two, three, and so forth. So it classifies things. And the way you do it is you feed it a whole bunch of features and a training set. So this was uh, this risk and this one and this one. And over time, it gets more and more accurate until it actually is uh, ready and that it actually can sort of guess based on statistical um, um, yeah, statistical um, data and relevance that it actually significance rather than that's what I was looking for. Uh, it can actually say, well, based on the previous data and previous information, then I think that I can actually make this classification based on previous or historical data. Um, I don't necessarily know how well it will work, but it will be interesting to, if you have enough data and actually the, um, the output of it, and then you run it into a model, and then see future results, if it actually is able to pick it up accurately or not. So there are things like Spark, um, so Databricks has a, sort of a, a SAS version of it, so you can maybe put some information in there and see like what results you can get. I mean, that sounds like a fantastic idea. The little I've done with machine learning, and I know it's, it's damn hard. You know, it, it, yeah. it takes a while. The one thing I'd be slightly worried about would be, one of the points we wanted to make was that we take away this kind of black box. You know, that even if we write our own engine, it's an engine that is, is checked in a repository that everybody can see. If they can be bothered to kind of read into it, they can see why this has more points, why this has a higher risk weighting. If we then put that into machine learning, it just becomes a, an automated, a robotic version of what security was. You know what I mean? I think as an advisory service, it would be fantastic. But I wouldn't want to make it be the thing that says yes or no. Just, just because the developer's going to go, oh, well, the security bot says no, I don't believe it. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, yeah, exactly, supervisory. So it will just advisory give it would you, be fantastic. It will yeah, give it you was. an output and say, hey, I think this would you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, if, if that would trigger something for the. <laughs> That would trigger uh, an email or anything like that to the upset team saying, hey, uh, somebody's trying to modify this policy. Um, and uh, through, through experience, I suggest we allow it. I guess that could be <laughs> something yeah, which can be yeah. taken into consideration by the upset team and probably something that would help the developer say, oh, look, you said no, but look, machine learning said yes. So maybe you should think about it uh, <laughs> twice. So yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. We we haven't thought about we haven't arrived to this um, um, scenario yet. Uh, it's something again that we're we're working on, and um, effectively everything everything you add into static attributes will will make the risk higher. So that's that's something that we really need to think very thoroughly about because uh, if if you add these attributes and you already have vulnerabilities, then probably your threshold is already surpassed a lot. So it's again, and you do want to fix vulnerability. So in the end, if you, if you get your threshold too low, just because you added a lot of attributes, and but you have vulnerabilities, but you put it too low, then you're not going to fix them because you had to take your threshold lower. So it's it's a lot of I think it's also philo uh, 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 goes into philosophy here almost uh, into exactly how you want to fine tune these attributes so you arrive to a risk score which is. Which brings you to the to the outcome that you want, which is to fix vulnerabilities and don't get hacked. Yeah. Any more questions, guys? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's it's really awesome stuff. I mean, you, you seem to be held by lack of maturity of application security tools, which is great for you. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing how come you managed to get the budget for all of that? Because it, it looks like a quite expensive and long-term uh, initiative. So is there any like visionary somewhere close to CEO that's supporting all of those activities? How did you get the funding for that? So I've, uh, I've been at the company quite a long time now. I think I've got the slippers almost, the second longest uh, developer. 
So basically, we had a, um, initially the security champions. The, the guy he was one of these kind of driving. He was um, head of security. I think the CTO left, and he almost filled that role. So we had that kind of technical oversight. If I'm honest, it's just been kind of hard work from the security champions. The only the only tool that costs money is Threadfix. Everything else, you know, Jenkins is free. The plugins are free. Everything else is just kind of hooked together with you know and. And, and Fortify was already signed off, so yeah. So the, the rest of it was just, just work, you know, over time. It was kind of getting the developers engaged, making sure that they had some kind of, uh, you know, incentive to say, you've done well, this is part of your job now, to, to increase security. And moreover, uh, my old development manager, again, very kind of driven guy, understood, he said, look, security want me to do these things. If you can make it faster and easier, I'm going to give you a bigger bonus. <laughs> You know what I mean? It was part of my personal review that I made security faster and more. And you know what? You need that. You need somebody to kind of provide that. If they don't incentivize that that's what you want to do, then why would anybody do it? And actually the most expensive. Yes. Uh, the most expensive. You're the manager, right? The most, yeah. The, the most, most budget. I, 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 I have access reward, to the budget. You're the reward developers <laughs> for making yeah. your company more secure. By the way, for developers, for security champions and developers, we do have security events uh, within the company. So we have used all our security shepherd um, effectively to organize the competition and we did provide prizes. So we, we've got budget for that as well for whoever won it. But just to say that on, on this side, actually the most expensive one is pen tests, which are done by, external, by, by an external consultancy we work with. Yeah, That's the most expensive one. But this is cost that everybody recognizes. You have to pay for that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. And finally, it is PCI yeah. in our specific case, which helps us uh, get this budget uh, because we do need to uh, recertify yearly. Um, and um, it, it, PCI will not be that mature, of course. They, they will not know about most of the detail that we mentioned here. But it's again very easy to get the um, or easier to get the budget if you mention PCI. This is a PCI requirement. Uh, we have to do something about that. Developers are getting annoyed. Uh, you can you can think of a lot of things to, to to throw in and motivate people to throw a bit more budget. Like for example, if you annoy developers, then they're going to leave. So that's a, that's a very good motivator. Um, yeah. That's, and and the last one. Yeah. How many people are involved in this? How many uh, agile teams do you have? How many people in uh, application security managing this? If you could shortly describe uh, your yeah. company, because I know nothing about it. Effectively, application security 100% full time is just me. And uh, but then there is a team of, of security champions, and, and Chris is also working with security very, very closely now. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just myself and the team of six. I think it was at some point security champions. I think uh, I think it's five now. Uh, and there are two scrum. There were three scrum teams. Well, uh, Chris, Chris Chris can tell you. Yeah, I mean, my main brief for this, like I mentioned earlier, we could have done a lot of what Tradfix does if we went in ourselves. My main brief is that you know we don't have a lot of resources to dedicate to it. So when the Jenkins plugin comes along, like a news brilliant. When Tradfix comes along and has a REST API, even better. That, you know, you know what we're doing is with kind of limited resources. Um, that's that's why I mentioned the the example with uh, the other company that developed everything themselves. Those were 15 people just in the AppSec team, and they had they had a an application security engineering team, which were actual developers that developed security tools. There were three people in that team, so they had three people full time developers working on security tools. You can have any approach you want. Uh, if the company puts security right up there and if there's a right uh, regulatory motivation, like PCI, you will probably get the budget. So, uh, how many developers exactly work with this process? With the, the security, so the developers in total is probably about um, maybe 15 to 20. Mm -hmm. The developers who help them contribute to this is maybe about five, four or five okay. in, the, in the kind of side time. By the way, I do talks like this to other members of my company to sell this in inwardly as well as outwardly. So if anybody, else, if you want a copy of the slides, be my guest. <laughs> you, can change, you can change the name to, to your name, I don't mind. Just, you know. Question is, is this tool on GitHub yet? So I mean, it's on a tell but it's quite, it's in it, it's empathy at the moment. The, the main kind of value I think we have is, is the ability to link this together um, and link it together without much resources, to be honest. So Donatello, it's not yet, so I can put it up there, but it's, it's basic at the moment. You know, once we start building those profiles, then it'll be more substantial. We can put an OS organization. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. We're, we're almost trying to, you know, 
the value I think in this is the, the mindset and the way we've overcome some of the challenges that you guys have probably had. Any more questions? So I like very much this idea, but I was thinking this seems to be very much focused on web application as we are talking in OWASP, but can it, it be adapted to fat client application or different sort of architectures? Yeah, I don't see any reason not. I mean, the, the static analysis, um, so it's could be the, the dependency check could be again. The, the dynamic app is app scanning. You're just limited by your tools, to be honest. Again, it's, it's the process of being able to automate these tools. If you want to slot in whatever kind of, um, even the in-house tool that you have in, into that bit here, as long as you make sure that you know we can upload it into ThreadFix, that's that's the. As long as you can map it to a CWE, then we're well, I think we're fine. Um, I suppose you'd have to call ThreadFix or contribute to the community version and try and get them to add it. But yeah, so yes, I think you first. So uh, first of all, it's quite good that you have all of these automated tests uh, run every commit, but. My question is, how often do you have manual penetration tests? Because, uh, as we all know, uh, scanners are not efficient enough. Well, so, so manual manual pen tests um, happen yearly. So there is a yearly budget for manual pen tests. So we get something like sixty to ninety. We get something to sixty to ninety days of uh, man days of pen testing, um, and uh, right now we have a we have a sort of an ad hoc rudimentary method of um, um, finding out what what applications are uh, have the biggest priority in order to get pen tested, which is called PCI. <laughs> so if, if PCI DSS, uh, which uh, I hope everyone knows what it is, uh, payments cards industry, so basically any company that deals with card numbers needs to be compliant with this. Um, if, if they are in the PCI environment, then they will be tested first. If there was any change brought to it, then that, that also um, uh, contributes to our decision to take to, to test them. At some point, we even brought in pen testers to um, or application security consultants to attend threat modeling exercises themselves, um, and um, it, it was it was useful. It was useful because some of the features that were presented were. Uh, at that point, assessed by real application security professionals. So um, I would say that that's our scenario, but this doesn't necessarily apply to other businesses. It's, it's you have to look at what applications you protect and what your business does, what is the risk appetite of that, that business. But yeah, we see the value of external pen tests and we will uh, hopefully, uh, given the budget, we will never uh, scrap them. One of the nice things with the architecture we have, where everything's kind of microservices based, is that they're all becoming very homogenized. So we get a lot more value when we have a pen test on one application. A lot of the things that they were pull out um, apply to the other applications. So a lot of the, the value we're getting from pen tests now is similar to what we'd, what we'd uh, find out in a threat model, an architectural threat model. So with the new applications anyway, you know, that's, we, we start with obviously our pen tests, but it becomes a, a more high value, kind of almost like a, an extra threat model from somebody external. <coughs> because we know that the, the server that we're using for everything is you know is quite sound, and we know that the, the jersey we're using is, is quite sound as well. You Any questions? You know, the state of the application constantly is changing, and uh, you're having so for me doesn't doesn't feel like let's say having an application which is constantly changing. You have scanners which is very good to check for the low hanging fruits, but you are having yearly. Uh, manual penetration test will, which will find issues related to the application logic. So we don't do, we have yearly um, penetration tests. Generally before a project goes live, we will still do uh, another penetration test, like a large new kind of um, group of microservices. But I agree, but I think the threat modeling exercise really mitigates a lot of that. So if I'm honest, the, the, we've had a lot of good value from penetration testing. Most of the logical bugs we found have been from in-house, have been from threat modeling sessions and from testers. And as we push those to, to closer to the beginning of a project, you know, we, we find that they block us less and we kind of deal with them earlier on. You know, they're, they're the domain experts. You know, that, that we, we tend to get more of the logical stuff in-house, to be honest. Okay, looks like they've got questions. Any more? Okay.
Well, one, one, one last one. So, can you guys share your threat models and the tools you guys do? Because I think one of the problems we're having is this: a lot of people doing threat models, but there's not not a lot of good examples. Yeah. So we've evolved over a while. I mean, we use different tools. We use you know the cards from Microsoft. We use the cards from Conicopia. Uh, at first, they weren't standardized. But now, yeah, I mean, we could do an example threat model for uh, an imaginary application, I suppose, and share it with the community. And not to say we're, you know, we're doing the best that anybody else is, but it'd be interesting for you guys to tell us your opinions on what we're doing, by all means. Yeah. So what tools do you guys use? Just or? No, we're going to use the board. Yeah. And, uh, and we are using OWASP Cornucopia to kind of help us. Yeah. So yeah. for those who don't know, OWASP Cornucopia is a game that you can go to OWASP.org and download and play. But if you're developing yeah. games, it's a card game. It's very addictive. We had, we had a product owner come into a couple of bird modeling sessions, which was interesting. I mean, they, they hated the live by the end of it. But as an education tool, it really, really kind of showed them that, you know, these things don't just come out of the grass. These are real requirements. A lot of thought goes into these things. Um, and that was a really good exercise. I recommend trying to so chain them to the floor for you know one or two hours. It's it's a good exercise. Okay, thanks so much, guys. Thank you. So that brings us almost to the end of the evening. I've got three more slides to show you, which are very very <laughs> quick. Okay, and uh, they all very come. October. Those of you who want to travel to America, okay, there's a brilliant conference going on, AppSec USA 2016 from October 11th to October 14th. Three days of what we have here but with about a thousand people from mostly America but all over the world, uh, plus training. So those developers who uh, want to learn security, right, there are lots and lots of training seminars for them. Uh, so, yeah, you can register, and I think the uh, keynote speakers are already announced. Okay, so uh, next we go to thanks, so we'll thank all the chapter sponsors which we currently have on the screen, including Expedia, who also does this wonderful conference facility called the Cruise Ship. Okay, let's see the bell. Okay, uh, thanks very much to our speakers, so Scott Helm, Lewis Adam, uh, Lucien Corlan, and Chris Adam. We are your chapter leaders, Sam and Sharif, obviously yourself after this. Thank you very much for making this event such a great success. Um, keep in touch with us, okay? I don't know how you found out about this event, but we've got mailing list. It's very low volume. We only email when we've got an event on. So I urge you to sign up. That's the best way to find out when the next event is on. Follow us on Twitter, Always London. If you're on Facebook, another Always London. Uh, so just Google Always London to find our webpage. All presentations from tonight will be uploaded, so you can download the PDF files. Videos will be available on our YouTube channel called Obos London as well. Okay, and uh, save the future dates. So last Thursday of September and last Thursday of November um, are going to be our future dates. Okay, so for September I'm looking at Dennis. I hope you can present something in September. I think we have another Slack channel for London. Mm. Yeah, so there's a Slack. Those of you who are on Slack, you can use Slack channel as well. Okay, and a call for speakers, guys. So obviously, a lot of security guys, developer guys, if you have a talk you would like to share within this community, more than welcome. So we've got three tracks. Breakers, yeah, if you'd like to break stuff. Defenders, if <laughs> you'd like to defend. And builders, if you're building some tools, like we just saw two being built, yeah, just email us at the West London. Yep. Uh, 
I just wanted to ask, what's the deadline for the presentation? Deadline is usually one month. Yeah. So uh, four weeks. But four weeks before the presentation is a couple of hours before. Yeah. For, <laughs> yeah. So, so you need to provide us with a, a title. Uh, title, abstract, okay, and bio of the speaker. Oh sure. Okay. And uh, I'm particularly looking for all the girl developers and girl hackers in here because we have another girl presenter since like 2009. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, please come forward and uh, submit some cool talks for us, please. Okay, so, now to the greatest part of the event, we can continue. Okay, we have a question from Scott. Oh, no, no, it's a question, just to say. Yeah, if anybody did you ask for the beers? Right? <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say, if anybody um, hasn't spoken before and would like help preparing or any kind of mentoring or any questions, I'd be more than happy um, to offer some support in that regard as well, to get some more speakers involved. You're coming to the pub, right? Yes. Yeah, so we're all going to go into this place. It's just around the corner, Brown House and Kitchen. Yeah, so for more beers until this pub shuts, so we'll be there until 11 pm. So thank you very much, guys, and see you in September.